Okay, yeah, so my, my talk is kind of more uh, closer to, you know, air hardware and electrical stuff. Um, there's some software as well, but it's uh, pretty simple. Okay, so um, how I came about doing this, you know, I had a goal where I actually had a uh, electrical door lock. It was bought from China, right? It has unknown reliability. Um, and, you know, when you read up or you have been using these devices for some time, you know, they kind of fail in various ways. Um, you know, the bolt gets stuck. You have... Uh, lock with un, like unreliability, etc. Right. So I really wanted to like have a rig to test it and like uh, exercise it at near real world operations. Like I actually want to you know um, move move the the the, uh, the latch up and down. Um, I want to simulate about like two years of lock and unlock actions, right? And then observe you know um, if there's any mechanical wear or failure. How does it fail? If it gets stuck. You know, why did it get stuck? Um, so let's talk about test parameters, right? I had to build a, uh, a rig in order for me to um, exercise the lock. Now, some some people have told me, hey, you can actually like just have a solenoid and like actuate the lock real quick. But I actually don't want to overheat the lock. I actually want it to have sufficient cooldown time. The manufacturer recommends like you know, five seconds between lock and unlock. Um, I did test like more uh, harsh cases, right? Much later, yeah. But at least you know the uh, I wanted to do more real world uh, simulation of this. Um, the open and close actions were made to be similar to a hinge door instead of just like moving a magnet under the lock sensor, right? I w I wanted to reveal um, each cases uh, such as jams. I think I encountered once or twice that the boat was like you know coming like well, there was some delay and then it kind of got stuck in the in the uh what do you call it the slot there's a slot that comes with it um yeah so for two years worth of open close cycles i basically ran this for about four to five days total um, we have like we actuated the lock about thirty six thousand times right and you know it's, it's kind of like yeah i could sit there press a button repeatedly to actuate the lock but building a rig would make it more reproducible and essentially like saves me time if I need to test more than one lock. Okay, so um, this video over here is um, why it's like how I build it up. It's just like me manually um, closing the lock. As you can see that this lock is kind of like different from other locks in that when you, um, if there's no power, right, you can actually like force the door to close and you can't open it. Okay, how do I go next slide? Okay, yeah, so the electrical system is pretty straightforward. Um, there's PC running a Python test script. The Python test script communicates with Arduino um, on a custom PCB. It's something that I made a couple of years back. I'm repurposing it here. I'll talk more about it later. The Python test script communicates with Arduino over a virtual USB. The uh, GPIO board would communicate with like the servo, um, a limit switch, and the door lock that's under test. The notice that the servo and the door lock they are like twelve volt devices. Um, so you know I had to have like a GPIO board that essentially translate voltages. Um, so something about this board, okay. So the original intent a couple of years ago is that it was actually meant to be a, a verifiable high voltage, high current, opto isolated I/O. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there. That's why I kind of like found it like. Um, easy to repurpose, right? I had like, it's opto isolated. So in case I accidentally short a 12 volt wire to my Arduino, I don't like, or, or like when I short some stuff on the high voltage side, I don't, you know, like uh, blow up my USB port, for example. Yeah. Um, previously, this board was meant to be verifiable as in that there's two Arduinos. One of them would provide eight inputs, eight outputs. The other Arduino would read in 16 inputs to verify what, the primary Arduino is doing. However, in my use case over here today, I only use half of the setup. Okay, only one of the two Arduino sockets was populated. Um, yeah, and it basically um, sends the signals through opto isolators, through drivers, so I can drive um, high current input and output. Um, the board kind of looks like this. Um, it was made a couple of years ago, and uh, I put the designs up in a in the Bitbucket, which I'll share the link later. Um, there's basically two sockets for Arduino Pro Micro, I think, uh, but only one is used, and there are kind of like LEDs there to help me debug what signals are on and off. 
um, the features of the firmware on over there, you know, is an Arduino friendly code. Um, anyone who has like uh, is familiar with it can just like open it and use it. Um, it runs a byte level protocol. So some people in the past may have heard of this thing called uh, Universal Bit Wacker. It's back in the peak 18F era. Uh, so this kind of like you know, follows that feature set. Um, it allows you to manipulate GPIO on and off, but the protocol level is not like string. It's not like by character, but you actually have to send bytes. So I had to write a like Python library in order to you know, make it more user-friendly. Um, it does like scan the input so that any changes on the input side will just be reported. If there's no changes, then nothing is reported. So that kind of like saves bandwidth over the serial link. Um, yeah, TTL serial. I did use the PWM output to control the big servo over there. Okay. Um, yeah, I open source this in my Bitbucket, and the link will be shared in the one the, in the last slide. So essentially, we or we how we run the test, right? Okay, the door, we test where the door is unlocked within a certain time limit. We wait five seconds and then we test that the door is swung shut within a certain time limit. If any of these time limits have uh, timed out, right, we assume that there's a jam and we'll power down the lock and motor. So over the course of like 36,000 iterations, it did jam about like six times. But of that six times, uh, I think five of the times was because a screw was loose on my servo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is like the overall setup over here. Um, the at the the top is where the door lock is. Um, below the door lock, there is like a servo. I bought a servo from China. From China, I think it was called Super Two Hundred, probably one of the earlier versions. The main reason why I use it was because it's really crappy. I'm not going to use it for any other projects, but it's useful for roughly opening and closing such a device. Yeah, and it's also really strong. I think it's it is a force by two hundred kilograms per cm yeah um, the gpio board is over there the usb goes to a pc behind and the, the stuff below is, uh, is purely um like converting like high voltage uh, 110 volts where i stay to uh, 12 volts 5 volts and uh yeah you know, it goes to the like, gpio board and the motors okay and uh this is just a video of the motor opening and closing. So it just like repeats this action, this really dumb action continually for four to five days. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what are the lessons learned from this whole exercise? Uh, of course, building it was pretty fun, right? I actually like read, you know, the hardware forums and I uh, got um, some of you talk about using ferrules for like connecting wires. I actually bought a, a ferrule set and realized that, hey, it actually saves me so much time to wire things up with ferrules. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I learned over here, okay, the servo precision was terrible. So in order to compensate for the terrible cheap China servo, I had to essentially like um, adjust the, uh, how would I say, the movement such that it actually slams the, the latch shut right but it will back off a little so that the you know the, the server won't be in a stuck position where it's actually uh exerting force right because that force actually cause wear in the in the joints and that also cause like the, the grub screw to wiggle out of the of the, the the joint between the servo axle and the hub yeah so i actually also stacked screws and loctite to address these uh, mechanical issues um, another thing is that i figured out these um, China locks, right? The trigger voltage is actually really weird. It's not TTL, it's not 5 volts, but it, you kind of like, it's probably like 12 volts. It expects like a large swing, right? Uh, because originally you're supposed to like connect it to a button, a, a uh, like a physical switch, right? So it really needs to swing between like less than 2 volts to more than 8 volts. Initially, because like my GPI robot was operating at 5 volts, what happened is that the pull down resistors kind of like kept the voltage below eight volts so i was wondering like you know yeah why why is the you know i mean like swinging between like zero and five but the lock is kind of stuck in the open position so i uh, if you saw on the right see the right side i had to throw in some random mpn transistor to eventually fix that yeah yeah so what about the lock right we've been talking about the whole mechanism so far um, so for this particular lock, you know, what I learned through 
testing, right? Like stress testing these things. Uh, you can see over here, what you see here is a lot of metal dust. <laughs> Essentially, there's a lot of brass powder, right? A close up. There's a lot of material coming out from a lock after 36,000 iterations. Uh, this is not good. Right? What we find, I disassemble, I tore down the lock to find that, you know, essentially there's no grease in there. There's no grease in there. There's a lot of metal wear, right? And that kind of like backs up the theory why many of these locks were just kind of like designed to fail, right? You know, you probably have to replace them the sooner or later, like real quick. Um, I think the earliest I saw was like two months, you know, um, two months to a year, you probably have to replace the lock. Or they're designed to be um, commodity disposable, Things, which I, I think is kind of bad, right? You realize you do a head on, you realize that these locks have not very good construction. Yep, another wear over here, which is actually on the axle um, connecting the uh, connecting the hammer to the solenoid. I can see there's some metal wear over there. And uh, no, it does feel kind of rough after 36,000 iterations. You try to move it by hand and you can feel it's more rough than it was brand new. Yep. This is like uh, the part where the hammer is like pushing the latch up and down. And you can see there is material loss here as well. There's literally a dent in the, the, the bolt is actually steel, but you know, having a steel hammer coming down against a steel bolt, you will still have metal fragments falling out of it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a link to anyone who is interested in uh, reference design for um, opto isolated GPIO circuit, you can just check out the uh, Bitbucket over here as well as the Arduino code Python library. Yep. Uh, this is like the power site, some old photos. Does anyone have any questions? In terms of noise, uh, you, you leave this for like, I don't know, two months. Clack, 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 clack. So you actually put some cloud box around to isolate or is it, it's not noisy, is it? Um, I only ran it for like five days, so it's not bad. And also it's kind of like in, uh, in the garage. So it's kind of isolated from where I am. Yeah. Uh, I like this kind of testing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, when you start buying stuff from China and you realize that your parts fail in your projects, you're kind of more interested to actually want to find out why they fail. And, and you know, now if I buy the same lock, I'll actually put grease in there before I use it. 